Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Kelly. I am the uh, Community Relations Program Host with the Rochester Hills Public Library. And I'd like to welcome you tonight to this evening's program, uh, this evening's Smart Town program, Advent of the Cell Phone with Dr. Carol Cooper at Rochester University. Tonight, attendees will remain muted uh, throughout the program. And you can please just use the chat feature throughout to ask questions. I'll take note of them. And after we get through our presentation, uh, I can moderate some questions uh, and we'll go through those uh, for an appropriate length of time. Uh, the program itself will be recorded and it will be available to view on the uh, library's YouTube channel about one week from tonight. Uh, and before we go ahead, I will also just briefly uh, talk about our series here. Smart Towns is a lifelong learning program sponsored by several community partners, including Rochester Hills Public Library, Rochester Avon Historical Society, Rochester Hills Museum at Van Hoosen Farm, Oakland University, Rochester University, Meadowbrook Hall and Ascension Providence Hospital, uh, Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital. For more about Smart Towns, please visit smarttowns.rhpl.org. And to introduce our program and say hello briefly before going right into it, uh, tonight I would like you all to wel please welcome Dr. Carol Cooper. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy uh, the video presentation that I've made, and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Fantastic. Uh, without further ado, I will go ahead and bring up our video. I think we should be. All right, so I'm going to get started. Uh, Carol, let me know if you're uh, experiencing any issues with volume or anything along the like. Thank you for joining me to learn about the advent of the cell phone. It has been a ubiquitous part of American society since the early 2000s. However, cell phone development began several decades ago. The idea of people using something small, portable, and personal is not new. The miniaturization of technology has a history that predates the transistor radio, the Sony Walkman, and the cell phone. The pocket watch was invented in 16th century Europe and is similar to the objectification of the cell phone because a pocket watch is small, it's portable, it's worn close to the body, and its display was sometimes regarded as being disruptive when people took it out to tell the time. The cell phone has not suddenly appeared for public consumption without reference to traditional telephone technology, or technological developments, nor the social, economic, or political influences of those producing it. A handwritten story was found some years ago, believed to have been written in 1874 by French novelist Jules Verne, about a handheld communication device that could also take photographs. In 1926, Nikola Tesla was quoted in a magazine article saying that telephony would eventually develop to a point where, and I quote, a man will be able to carry one in his vest pocket. The idea of a small portable communication device has also been popularized by television, such as on the satirical TV show Get Smart, which first aired in 1965, and whose main character, Agent 86, had a small phone embedded in the heel of his shoe. And of course, there's the original Star Trek series that began in 1967. The first flip phones of the mid-1990s was reminiscent of what viewers had seen on Star Trek. Mobile communication was also important to police. In the early 1920s, individuals within the Detroit force experimented in developing one-way radio communication, which came to fruition in 1928, when Detroit introduced a fully voice-based mobile radio system. To meet Federal Radio Commission licensing requirements of the time, police officers broadcast recorded music in between lists of stolen vehicles and descriptions of missing children. Broadcasting station W8FS was set up on Bell Isle to support it. The Detroit success was replicated by police around the country. The 1939 World's Fair touted a future of personal mobility and telephones without cords. General Motors' two exhibitions, City of Tomorrow and Futurama, promised a society where technology made life easy and convenient. 
Innovations were promised by other companies too at the World's Fair, such as Ford, Chrysler, what is now AT&T, General Electric, and Edison Consolidated. So to begin with, the development of the cell phone in America was influenced by the development of police communication and the vision of some industrial giants projected onto the nation. In addition, the sheer size of the U.S. and being more mobile became part of the American culture in relation to getting to work or traveling to see family and friends, which was not experienced by people in many other countries. Traveling by car was also more normal for Americans than those in other countries. Second, Americans want to be contactable most of the time. In the 1980s, more American households purchased pagers or beepers than any other country besides Japan. Then as answer machines became affordable, more American households purchased them than any other country. Third, Americans have historically used traditional landline telephones more than their European counterparts. Part of the reason for this is that telephones were issued by government agencies in some of those countries, and there was a monthly rental fee for the device, as well as a per-call fee when you made a phone call. So picking up the phone did not become a habit for other cultures in the same way as in the United States. The U.S. is distinct from most other countries in that its telecommunications systems have been created and maintained by private enterprise rather than government entities. Therefore, the context for current mobile tele telecommunication regulations has historical underpinnings. The Federal Communication Commission was established in 1926 and was designed to be a centralized authoritative body that would regulate the communication services in relation to national defense and public safety for all citizens. The beginnings of the technology for the cell phone as it is today can be illustrated by focusing on Motorola, who was the pioneer in developing mobile communications globally. In 1940, the Galvin Manufacturing Company, which would become Motorola, had developed the two-way handy talkie that was used extensively in World War II to provide communication between armed forces headquarters and units in the field. By 1943, it had developed the portable walkie-talkie for the U.S. Army Corps, which had a range of 10 to 20 miles. Motorola also provided limited car phone service equipment in Chicago during the early 1940s. Motorola's main research and development focus had been in television and radio, and its development of the radio pager in the mid-1950s was adopted first by the medical profession. Then, in 1973, Martin Cooper made the first portable radio telephone call using a Motorola Dynatac. Magazine ads at the time claimed that most people would have similar phone capabilities as early as 1976. The Motorola Dynatac cell phone was licensed by the FCC in September 1983, but not available to consumers until 1984. In 1989, Motorola introduced the Microtac, which at the time was the smallest and lightest cell phone model. By this time, the pager was gaining popularity as a form of portable communication, and nearly 50 million Americans had one by the early 1990s due to all the delays of the development of the cell phone. In 1996, the StarTac, the world's first wearable cell phone, was developed by Motorola. Motorola continued to offer improved models of pagers and continued research and development in other technologies such as HDTV. Motorola had the technology to produce cell phones and reach the forefront of the industry, but it was very diversified in its focus. One of the reasons Motorola is not remembered as the pioneer of the cell phone as we recognize it today is because unlike AT&T, Motorola only made cell phones and cell phone equipment and, not, uh, and was not a service provider. 
A quick comparison about research and development going on at Bell Laboratories, from which AT&T had eventually emerged, focused on the wider implementation of cell phone technology in a way that Motorola had not. First, Bell acquired the available radio spectrum that is licensed by the FCC in order to provide car phones to 25 cities across America, beginning with St. Louis in 1946. And this symbolized the American predisposition to towards uh, mobility. Second, Bell developed a system whereby several smaller transmitters would automatically hand off one call from one transmitter to another and the user would never notice a loss of sound. On, the pa on paper, the system looked like a honeycomb. Hence, in the United States, we refer to our mobile communication as cellular service and our first mobile phones as cell phones. I've already alluded to the fact that the U.S. was slower to adopt the personal cell phone than many other countries. There were a variety of constraints that initially delayed the advent of the cell phone, and here are a few more. One delay was due to the fact that the FCC had not yet decided how the radio spectrum was to be divided and licensed. As lobbying continued among vying companies, cell phones were not being manufactured for the general public. That let pagers and CB citizen band radios become popular with many Americans. Both forms of communication technology were cheap and accessible and provided instant portable communication. The public by and large were unaware of the possibilities of the cell phone. The FCC's allocation of cell phone towers also delayed the advent of the cell phone. The FCC restricted the number of airway frequencies allocated to cell phones and the number of cell phone tower allocations in order to prevent monopolies. It was not until 1981 that the FCC announced how the radio spectrum would be divided and licensed for cell phone communication. Furthermore, Back in 1980, AT&T conducted a study on the future of the cell phone and had claimed that there would be less than 1 million U.S. cell phone subscribers by the year 2000. And so there was little urgency in developing the cell phone if its profitability was unlikely. In fact, according to the Cellular Technology Industry Association, there were 109.5 million U.S. subscribers by the year 2000. They got it wrong. The first cell phones of the 1990s were considered to be portable communication devices for young professionals who could afford both the phone itself and the cell phone service. Cell phone developers did not consider it to be a product for the general population, just as the developers of the original telephone did not think women would potentially ever use a phone. However, since the popularity of pagers and CBs indicated that Americans were already predisposed to the idea of mobile communications, there was a demand for affordable cell phones. As this summary suggests, the reasons for the delay in the development and distribution of cell phones to consumers are largely historical, rather than due to a lack of interest. By the beginning of the 21st century, the cell phone became ubiquitous in the United States. Marketing and advertising was created to encourage consumers to buy 3G phones and pay the extra fees for the data delivery, separate from the cost of voice-to-voice -voice communication. With the message that consumers had more choices about how to use their phones paid off because it appealed to the consumer's sense of freedom and mobility. Consumers thus became part of the innovation and diffusion process as the cell phone developers and manufacturers, service prov providers, regulators, advertisers, and the like responded to consumer feedback. In addition, the increasingly popularity of shopping online meant that cookies embedded into websites tracked purchasers' habits and decision-making processes and could be used more accurately to determine production, distribution, and marketing and advertising methods, as well as the purchase price 
f that the market would tolerate. How a cell phone will be used cannot be totally predetermined by its innovators and marketers because there is not a universal way in which consumers appropriate and incorporate a cell phone into their lives. The cell phone is located within specific historical, social, and cultural settings. If consumers purchase a cell phone and find it useful, they become more comfortable with it and the cell phone becomes embedded into everyday life. The most common reasons for people acquiring a cell phone according to one survey are as follows. For social contacts, for coordination of life, for family contacts, for personal safety, because it gave cheaper long distance phone calls, there was ability to store information, there was the ability to send information, there was an emotional attachment to the cell phone and there was also a sense of privacy when using the cell phone. Such dependency on the cell phone means the ongoing anticipation of future new cell phones with more and more features. Whereas the landline phone was at one time perceived as a symbol of modern life, the cell phone arguably represents postmodern life. It is a cultural technology representing mobility, flexibility, and associated with a person rather than a physical place. The cell phone represents a way to create or maintain business, social, and cultural activities. It is at once very, a very personal device, providing emotional and symbolic link to family and friends, while offering the potential for online communication to a wider audience through text messages, photos, video, and in the case of smartphones, to the internet. Statistically, texting remains the most prolific aspect of using a cell phone. Some may not know this, but text messaging technology was added by developers as an afterthought. The technology for it existed and so it was decided to incorporate it into the cell phone design in case it proved useful for sending short messages and could become an alternative to the pager. There was no direct intention for its use. No one thought texting would actually become popular because it was initially limited to a message of 160 characters and predated having a keyboard on the cell phone. Messages were written by repeatedly pressing a number button corresponding to its alphabet letter. However, because of the original high cost of making cellular phone calls, the earliest texters, texters turned out to be teens and those who were economically disadvantaged. Teens, in fact, adapted to the character limitations by inventing their own localized texting shorthand and slang. Texting allowed people to be available at all times on the one hand, and on the other, it offered more flexibility to choose when to respond to communication messages. Texting as a synchronous form of communication seems to be embedded into the fabric of society as, the, as a whole because of the following. First, it is more private than someone overhearing a phone call. Texting creates a kind of barricade between people in conflict with one another and or it facilitates embarking on potential new relationships. It makes one's location anonymous. Think about it. With the traditional telephone, a person always knows the location they are phoning. With a cell phone call, one might ask, where are you? But with texting, you just send the message. Texting allows for communication without the need for immediate reciprocal conversation or in-depth conversation. It can just be a way of staying in touch. Society isn't an homogenous group even when, when we share some of the same motivations for texting. This leads conveniently to a brief discussion about some other social issues that the advent of the cell phone has raised over time. The first is cell phone addiction. It is not difficult to find popular articles or even academic research declaring that some people are addicted to the cell phone, especially teens. 
However, recent U.S. research within the field of psychology has suggested that the growing trend of cell phone dependency is due to lack of impulse control typical in developing teens rather than to addiction. While other studies have concluded that cell phone use is contagious and that people are more likely to use their phones if they see other people using their cell phones. Because cell phone activity is more public than the traditional telephone could be, it is difficult to compare cell phone habits today with the past. Some of you may be old enough to remember families who had a phone extension in another part of the house. I remember having a friend in 10th grade who not only had her own phone, she had her own phone number. There was no clear way one could have accurately monitored whether or not she had cell phone addiction. Another issue is called moral panic. The mass media has largely perpetuated fears about teens using cell phones. It has been said that nothing has been more disruptive to society since the invention of rock and roll. I think that such a statement is related more to the fact that no one imagined teens would adopt text messaging and surpass any other age group in using that function. Canadian philosopher and media theorist Marshall McLuhan once said that the new environment created by the traditional telephone was an irresistible intruder. And some have felt that way when the first iPhone was introduced in 2007. The way in which the cell phone has been portrayed by some news media as a threat to normal life not only influenced parents but also authorities. Historically, one of the key concerns about mass media such as radio, the original telephone, and television had been whether they enhance community life or they destroy it. Arguably, radio and television are media that can be enjoyed either as a group or as an individual, whereas the cell phone sometimes is seen as a medium offering more private pleasure. Another moral panic surrounds the fear that people will lose the art of interpersonal communication. Sociologist Irving Goffman studied the way people present themselves to others in social spaces. He said that in American culture, one is expected to be ready for interpersonal communication and people must be physically uh, present to present themselves as ready for such a possibility. The cell phone has not necessarily changed the purpose of interpersonal communication, but it has made po it possible to do so without being face-to-face. -face. The idea of moral panic seems cyclical. Rapid changes in technology mean that people are almost always experiencing some kind of transition that comes with new technological innovation, whether it is an LED light bulb or the end of analog television. It can come suddenly, it can seem disruptive, and it can redefine what normal is going to be. Technological changes inevitably result in changes in social relationships and thereby raise issues about power, trust, and responsibility. Another social issue is that of cell phone etiquette. Its physical presence can sometimes represent the disruption of social norms, hence the public announcements about turning off your cell phones or silencing them at various events. The use of the cell phone in public spaces is an interesting phenomenon. Not all social spaces are the same. Whereas one might use it at the mall, one would probably not use it in a place of worship. It is worth thinking about why this is so and what it says about our sense of social correctness and who determines what that is. The appropriation and incorporation of the cell phone into everyday life seems like the communication solution to an increasingly mobile lifestyle. It happened with great speed. The cell phone has blurred the distinction between public and private because its portability allows people to use it wherever they are allowed and even when used in public spaces it is often being used for private purposes such as texting or taking photographs. 
It symbolizes a cultural conflict for some because the activity is contrary to traditional ideas about what should be taking place in that space and the kinds of behavior that are expected in those spaces. Because the cell phone is small, portable, and pers personal, it has been regarded by some as an extension of the body and is private. The fact that today people can be physically present and yet socially, em emotionally, or mentally absent because they are using the cell phone in some capacity is not a new phenomenon. This has been termed absent presence and really began with the impact of print and the ability for a reader to be transported elsewhere through the act of reading, whether they were at home or in a library, alone or with other people. At one time, both radio and television were gathering points for family, raising the potential for family conversations and interaction. Nowadays, most homes have multiple media devices that allow family members to be absent present in different parts of the house in the home. The advent of the cell phone has provided just another way for an individual to become isolated from physical presence and to become immersed into a presence connected through te technology. The last social issue I want to draw attention to is what is known as the digital divide. Even with greater internet and cell phone coverage throughout the U.S., and a wider variety of affordable smartphones. A divide will remain as long as there are those who cannot afford either a smartphone or a computer. A study conducted in 2019 showed that 96% of Americans owned cell phones and that 85% of those were actually smartphones. Males represented the largest number of owners of either device and those 18 to 49 years old owned the most smartphones. However, there is a disparity of smartphone ownership by ethnicity, income, and geography. The lower the annual income, the fewer adults anywhere in the U.S. owned smartphone. Roughly 3 in 10 adults with household incomes below $30,000 a year owned a smartphone. More than 4 in 10 did not have home broadband services or a traditional computer. Black, Hispanic, and also adults living in rural areas of the U.S. owned the fewest smartphones, with the rural population being the lowest. Only 79% of rural Americans had broadband access in 2019. With fewer options for online access at their disposal, including a local library, many lower-income Americans will rely solely on a smartphone should they be able to obtain one. Such a reliance on a smartphone also means that the less affluent will be using them for tasks traditionally reserved for larger screens. This has physical ramifications, too, if one imagines how labor-intensive it would be to complete a job application or for a student to write an essay using a smartphone. The potential consequences for people's lives when their choices to own technology are limited hinders a thriving society. To conclude, the advent of the cell phone has developed over many years from the continued imagined uses for portable communication devices. It represents modifications of older technologies and the implementations of new technologies combined with strategic marketing and advertising to bring it to the consumer. Just as cultural theorist Raymond Williams distinguished between talking about television as a technology and talking about the uses people have for television, the advent of the cell phone should be regarded with a more dynamic view as a communication technology that is socially produced and that has social effects. The advent of the cell phone has created its own environment, privileging some forms of communication over others, just as, for example, television renders specific effects that are different from the effects of reading a newspaper. 
The advent of the cell phone has made visible the kinds of social communication that are a part of creating and defining one's identity and culture. The advent of the cell phone has facilitated people's ability to conduct their lives outside of the confines of fixed geographical locations. I posit that the cell phone has become ubiquitous because it seems to fulfill an emotional and social need that is valuable to a person's sense of identity and well-being and is not going to end anytime soon. Thank you. All righty. Any questions? Okay. We have one from uh, Kent says, are we as good at multitasking as we think? Uh, being on the cell phone while another is attempting to communicate interpersonally or uh, in a lecture, for example. There are increasing studies that say, no, we aren't. We're deluded. Uh, and other people say that we've always had distractions in life, whether it's a telephone ringing, a child needing our attention, the sound of, of somebody working outside. But that that's not multitasking. That's having some external things to disrupt our focus and concentration. I think a lot of people are able to do more than one thing at a time. Uh, those of you who are siblings or parents uh, probably can do something and be totally aware of what somebody else is doing at the same time and actually answer to whatever that person is doing. So I think it's something that research is going to continue. What's interesting is the media or the mass communication field are not researching it to the same extent as psychology and sociology. And sometimes there's a disconnect between what sociologists and psychologists are saying with people in mass communication who are actually constructing the messages. And there needs to be more dialogue between all three of those groups. Very good point. Uh, we have one from, I believe, Michaela. Uh, she says, you mentioned text messaging coming as an afterthought to the cell phone. Were there other applications that came before? They really just wanted to do voice communication to begin with. Uh, just that idea of being portable and personal. And so the very first phones were just phones that called and did nothing else. Plus there was texting if people wanted to use it. Okay. Uh, I believe we have another one from uh, Charles and he asks, is there reliable data regarding the safety of driving and phone use? And I believe, I think they're also asking in regards to both, um, you know, not just like texting and driving, which is, has very obvious dangers, but probably also driving while also talking on the phone. There is the, uh, and I, I was, I put it in and then I was aware of time constraints and such so out. The National Highway Transport Association Authority, NHTS, I don't know if the A is authority or uh, association now, uh, as early as the 1970s when car phones were being put in to the, those who could afford car phones in their cars and their vehicles, um, noticed that there was uh, a problem with people's attention span and the distractive driving. And they presented for Congress a whole research about the fact that we did not need um, hands-free mobile communication in our cars, let alone texting or f physically holding the cell phone. And um, Congress at the time asked for that research to be kept for a while because the FCC, and it was through the FCC, uh, Federal Communication Commission, and uh, when the report finally was released, we already had our first hand freeze uh, device uh, setups in different cars in America. The Mercedes was one of the first ones to have it. And so again, it was, it was introduced through, you know, for people who could afford it, affluence down to us ordinary folk. Um, so there was not a demand from the public for any kind of communication device like that in the, in the car, 
but through marketing and advertising, now it's a main feature in new vehicles that we can have hands-free communication. Um, so that is one of those things that shows you how much the idea of institutions um, and regulations impact some of our communication vehicles, uh, ways that we uh, communicate. And the other thing that I, I'll mention that in case they may come up, uh, we never asked for anything on our wrists. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember the Casio phones. They, first of all, they were our first digital wristwatches and they had a little alarm on it. They also tried a TV phone. Nobody wanted them. And yet because developers, you know, they're creative people, they're not just scientists. And when the technology is there, the, the desire is to create what the technology can do. And again, so if technology teams up like Apple iWatch with the right kind of marketing devices and uh, get the word out to the consumer, they can create the desire for, and people will wind up buying it. Excellent. Uh, and just uh, as a side note, I ended up looking up the uh, exact administration we were talking about and uh, it's the, uh, the, like a trick answer. It's the National Highway Traffic Sa Safety Administration. Safety Administration, thank you. <laughs> so uh, that's, Oh, there always had to be another A. <laughs> um, so our next one's from Danny. Uh, they say uh, they're curious about the absent presence concept. Uh, do you happen to know who was credited with this idea and when it was first mentioned? Uh, Gergen is the one that uh, did that. Uh, he, it was his idea. Um, he, and he, I'd have to look him up and I'm very happy to give you a, sort of my reference list for it. I wanna say it was in the 1960s and early 70s. He could have been earlier than that, but he was a constructionist where the idea that uh, our reality is constructed by media and the more medias that we consume. And uh, he was the one that termed that uh, phrase absent presence. Excellent. Uh, we have another from Anne, uh, who notes uh, that the, pandem the pandemic has made us increasingly reliant on our technology. Uh, to what extent will post-pandemic life be driven by uh, craving for in-person experiences versus the new level of reliance on technology being something of a point of no return? Well, that's sort of the $64,000 question, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that uh, and Michaela I know is on uh, in the in the room tonight and we were talking about this in class on Monday I'm going to go on campus tomorrow and eat in the cafeteria I just had this casual sort of mention about you know who are you seeing and they said nobody you know except for like the dean of the students and and some people and I said well, I'll just come and eat in the cafeteria tomorrow so my heart wants to say we're going to want to reach out and touch I won't burst into song for those of you who know what I'm referring to um, more after the pandemic, but there's going to be an element of the population, I'm sure that are going to be very reluctant to have human contact because they live in a kind of fear. And so I think we're gonna see both and whether or not we will eventually see one privileging the other, I don't know. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to think that, that we will use our, our cell phones, so to speak, to make arrangements in order to go and meet people. Oh, okay, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, next, we have one from Damon, who says, uh, when did they decide to turn cell phones into something like a computer in your pocket? So I'm get, like something like smartphones. Uh, do you think this was a good idea? Personally speaking, um, I don't know. We seem to be having a lot of chiropractor visits and, and health related issues. And they call it the cell phone stoop because we can do everything on our cell phone. Um, so I'm not sure in the long run, um, we're looking up and seeing the, the sky and the trees with it, but the idea uh, of putting internet capabilities started as early as 2G phones if people would pay for it. And then by 3G, it was kind of a given. And we're, we're coming up to 5G and some people already have 5G. So it goes back to the research and developers. They knew they could do it. And therefore, they decided that they, they were going to experiment. And, you know, it's their creative outlet to see, can we do it? As soon as nanotechnology became possible and the miniaturization of everything, 
uh, it just sparks people's imagination and research and development. It's, and those of us who are not techies, and I'm not a techie at all, uh, I, it, it was kind of enlightening to me to, to learn more about research and developers of the cell phone and the excitement they felt when they felt they, they could put this uh, into a, a cell phone and let people be even more mobile. I don't think they meant for it to be excluding any other part of society. I just thought they really thought it was a, a symbol of the person on the go and it was gonna be helpful to them not become like a habit. Hmm. Uh, Emily asks, uh, do you think teens ability to communicate in person will change negatively because of the advent of cell phones? Well, that's a loaded question because I teach young people, but anyway, yeah, I, it already has. I mean, it's not, will it, it has, uh, hmm. people break up by texting. People ask people to go on dates by texting. Um, people find it hard to give eye contact when you're having even a quick conversation. Um, people want to look at their phones and listen to you like radio uh, rather than give you eye contact. So I think it already has. And what's interesting is that the first teens who started these habits or, or developed these habits are now reaching 40 years old. Some of them still have those habits. So it's not necessarily just a young person's situation. And I know that there are probably some uh, millennials in, in the group tonight too. And I'm sure you're tired of the millennials this and millennials that, just as much as teens this, teens that. There's an idea of a cohort phenomenon going on where it's not to, to be about an age, but it's about a lifestyle. So for instance, think of video gaming. Uh, and I mentioned this in, in one of my classes as well. Um, I remember the beginnings of Dungeons and Dragons, D&D, and doing that. And uh, I, I wasn't good at it. It wasn't my sort of thing. But I remember when it began. My 26-year-old daughter does it. My 14-year-old great-niece does it. You can't say it's four different ages. And I don't think you can with some cell phone habits uh, either. It's about personality types and what people enjoy doing. So it's kind of like a cohort. And like you can go to Comic-Con and see a whole variety of, of age groups now. It's about their interests and their likes. And I think that's what we're seeing with the cell phone. Although the media, and I mean, I'm part of mass communication, but I, you know, sometimes you dog on your own, don't you? And, and we perpetuate it with some of the reporting that we do that makes it sound like it's a teen problem or it's a millennial problem. It's a cohort. It's about personality and, and, and what has fed into your own lifestyle. Excellent. Uh, we have a, one from Taylor, and this might be a, something of a loaded one, a uh, loaded question, but she says, as a professor yourself, do you mind when students have phones out during class and specifies, uh, for example, what if they say they're taking notes on their phone since there are options to take notes on a cell phone. Some professors do not allow phones and others do. It seems to be a very divisive topic uh, given the increasing utility of smartphones. Well, I don't think Taylor read my syllabi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I not only do I not want any electronic devices on in my class unless we've decided to do it as a group. Uh, I also give a, a, a link to some research about how cognitively the act of writing engages your memory better. Most of us can do a keyboard and we do it from muscle memory and the same cognitive process isn't going on when we're taking notes uh, on a computer or on a, on a phone. Um, I have said to students before, you know, put your phones away. Or I've sort of said, I don't know what I said that was so funny. So why are you smiling when I've just made a serious point, which is totally embarrassing to the student, but I try and use humor sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know what would you sit in front of, I don't know, the president or some other you know person and get your phone out and start texting so there is you know people make up their own cell phone etiquette and so they have you know relations like well i might do it for a professor i wouldn't do that in front of my great grandmother i would do it in front of my dad you know we we make it up as we go along and and find our level of comfort with it but no i i'm you know and we most people don't anyway in my classes but if i don't have any problem 
I'm an old public school teacher. I don't have any problem calling someone out. <laughs> uh, we, we're, we're close to the end. We have uh, two more uh, questions here. We have one from Chloe. She says, um, or they say, uh, because of our phones being a computer in our pocket and us now being reliable, uh, reliant on the internet as access to society uh, because of the pandemic, do you think coming out of the pandemic will be able to return to a normal face-to-face -face communication style or people will be even more dependent on their phones than pre-pandemic? So this is kind of similar to the yeah. previous question, but I think it, even more so, uh, we're, we're, I think we're asking less of a, will people rely on this more and more or do we think that uh, people have gotten, kind of gotten accustomed to even outside of just socially speaking, um, you know, I, like right now, I, I, for my work here and you here are presenting digitally. So do we yeah. think like maybe in terms of our practices, we might see people becoming sort of accustomed to an ease of uh, accessibility or operation or develop habits that might be hard to uh, break going back to a uh, normal uh, behavior as it were. It's a really good question. And I think we're gonna find out um, and that's not to dodge the question by any means, but I think that when I look back, um, my father-in-law is 92 years old and he went through Second World War uh, in London during the Blitz as an a adolescent with a bucket of water when they bombed to try and keep the roof of their warehouse from being destroyed. And listening to him and having lived uh, in the UK for 15 years, it took a long time for them to pull out of all the restrictions they had after the Second World War. And I think what we have to do is we're going for this pandemic, we're going to have to give ourselves permission to take the time we need to figure it out and to allow ourselves to uh, respect each individual as they try and figure it out and, and, and not cave into peer pressure. Um, like I said uh, in, in, my, in my talk, when we see people using their cell phone or seeing people using technology, it, it tends to make us feel like, oh, well, we're going to do it too. I think we need to give our, ourselves permission to figure out what's our best path to feeling whole again and to feeling normal again. And it may be that technology will facilitate that. It may be that you uh, realize you have mental health issues and the best way you're gonna access that is going to be phoning somebody or using one of the online services that exists. So I think there, there's great potential for it to work out okay um, as long as we don't try and put a timeline on we need to snap back to whatever normal is you know, within six months or a year. Um, you know, what did Mr. Rogers say? It takes a lot of slow to grow. Mm -hmm. I think, I think we need to let ourselves do that. And I think that'll be very important in the months coming ahead. Um, um, Kayla asks, uh, talked about how Motorola was the first company to create the cell phone. Uh, is this an American company? Uh, and then if so, did they have an impact on how quickly America adapted the use of personal handheld phones. Well, as I said, Motorola was the first but because of all the FCC regulations, uh, we were some of the last people. In fact, when going back to teens and texting, our teens were texting maybe three years behind the rest of Europe and Southeast Asia. And part of that was because we, we just were slow with regulation and trying to figure out and not having the monopolies of, of some one company owning all the cell phone towers. So, uh, people forget that Motorola uh, sort of began it. And then in, uh, in Europe, Nokia was then kind of took over. And, uh, and people just don't remember Motorola very much. And their phones, because they didn't have the same advertising, they always were focused on doing a whole bunch of research and development. They didn't concentrate just on the cell phone. And at one time, so Nokia was selling more cell phones than anywhere else in the, any other brand in the, in the world. And we find that kind of hard to believe because in America, we kind of think that whatever, because we're a big country, whatever we sell must be the most, but that's not always the case. I hope that answers the question. And if not, you know, a, a follow up with that. 
Excellent. Uh, I, I, I will personally ask uh, one question that I was curious about because you noted uh, how difficult it was. You know, we have a lot of lack of information uh, as to a lot of people kind of purport that there's this cell phone addiction, but there's so much uh, phone usage that could not really be properly studied or accounted for because it was more private and separated in the home uh, with old landlines. Um, uh, do you think similarly what may affect something like that uh, might be the uh, economic and financial models that come with a cell phone, whereas uh, like a lot of old landline usage, it was pretty much when you, when you used your phone, you were, you were paying to make calls. And uh, cell phones uh, over time developed, I, I mean, they both did, but cell phones, uh, I guess, earlier in their life cycle developed things like unlimited data or unlimited texting and things like that. Do you think that affected the usage of cell phones and our relationships to using them? Yeah, I think you're, you're correct on that. And, and, and that was another delay in America uh, that put us behind the rest of the world. We were, for texting especially, it costs money to send a text. It costs money to receive a text originally. And that wasn't happening in the rest of the world. And so again, we, we, we lagged behind on that. And just the, the demand of the, from the consumers they didn't want to put up with it. And as more people began to, to make phones for the public to buy, and we had different service providers, then that competition between the companies made some, like the first one, like, I'm going to offer unlimited data. And then everybody else was like, ooh, now I have to you know, offer unlimited data. So part of it was market competition. Um, and part of it was consumer feedback. You know, we go back to that sort of, you know, cookies and the embeddedness and, and being able to, to know what people's opinions uh, were. Um, so that definitely uh, had, a, had an effect on the, the speed or lack of uh, for the use of the cell phone. Excellent. Uh, well, I believe that's all the questions we have. Uh, so uh, I think what we'll do is if you'd like to give us any closing words or uh, say anything uh, to kind of wrap us up tonight. Well, um, I referred to Marshall McLuhan just briefly in passing in, in my talk. And uh, he, you know, said the medium is the message. And then in his book, Understanding Media, the publishers got it wrong. And it said the medium is the massage. <laughs> and I am not... Uh, I'm a glass half full person. I am not a technological determinist. I do feel even if you need an accountability partner, technology does not own us. The cell phone does not own us. We have the possibility to put it down, turn it off, leave it alone, leave it at home, whatever. Um, and so I, I remain hopeful that no matter where we go with technology, whether it's a cell phone or some other kind of technology, that we realize we're actually in charge of it. It doesn't own us. It's a tool. It's a tool like brushing your teeth is important. A cell phone's important, but you know, we don't brush our teeth every day. We do what's good for us. So I hope that uh, it's, it's something that we can feel empowered that it's, it's our tool. It's not, we're not, it's uh, lackey. Excellent. Uh, we're getting a lot of thank you. So I will join everyone here in saying thank you very much for thank joining you. us, Dr. Cooper. It was a wonderful presentation. And thank I you think very much. you're welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. I think with that, we will say uh, we'll call it a night. So thank you okay. everyone for joining us. Have thank you. Good night, everyone.